Welcome, everyone. My name is Francine Allen. I'm a registered dietitian with the Medical Affairs Department at Nestle Healthcare Nutrition. I am delighted to introduce today's speaker and assist you with the webinar entitled Nutrition-Focused Physical Assessment Part 2, Creating Your Malnutrition Toolbox. This is the second webinar of a three-part series. Part 1, Setting the Stage for Success, was presented on March 18th. Part 3, Micronutrient Deficiencies, will be presented on April 29th. Financial support for this presentation was provided by Nestle Healthcare Nutrition. The views expressed are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent Nestle's views. The material is accurate as of the day it was presented and is for educational purposes only. It is not intended as a substitute for medical advice. Dr. Frank is a registered dietitian and holds a BS in nutrition science, a master's in nutrition and dietetics, and a doctorate in exercise physiology. While working as a postdoctoral fellow for the University of Washington, she also received a master's in public health and epidemiology. Dr. Frank has published several peer-reviewed papers and book chapters. Currently, Dr. Frank is Clinical Assistant Professor and Director Preceptor of Clinical Sites for the Coordinated Program in Dietetics in the Nutrition and Exercise Physiology Program at Washington State University in Spokane. She is also the owner of Frank Nutrition and Exercise Consulting. She works closely with malnourished patients, providing nutrition inter intervention to maintain and promote lean body mass, replete nutritional status, and improve health outcomes. Dr. Frank is active in various nutrition organizations and has spoken at the local, state, and national level regarding changes in the healthcare landscape and elevating the role of the dietitian in nutrition assessment, physical assessment, and evidence-based nutrition intervention to treat the malnourished, hospitalized, or community-dwelling adults. Welcome, Dr. Laura Frank. Thank you, everybody. Uh, well, we are going to be talking about creating your malnutrition toolbox today, but I want to highlight some call to actions that we had from webinar one. And we already know that the dietitian is the appropriate expert to identify and treat patients for malnutrition, and that our ultimate goal is to improve patient outcomes. Ways that we can achieve this goal are to engage in physical assessment as part of the nutrition care process. Prior to adopting hands-on assessment of your patient, you need to set the stage for success through institutional and collaborative support. Find your nutrition ambassador and develop a plan. We need all clinical nutrition managers to be our advocates and support our efforts for education and practice in nutrition-focused physical assessment. We need to also explore the severity of malnutrition and document with appropriate language to help drive coding and reimbursement, and to elevate the role of nutrition and healthcare to meet the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or PPACA, mandates, such as decreased length of stay, as well as the reduction in readmissions and overall costs. My objectives today are to describe the role for the RD in accurately identifying the severity of illness related to the six characteristics of malnutrition, to discuss the differences in the biologic drivers in etiology-based malnutrition, to identify key resources to create a malnutrition toolbox to help us engage in nutrition-focused physical assessment, which I will often refer to as NFPA, and finally to discuss another call to action to improve patient outcomes. Now, due to the lack of a universal definition for malnutrition, an international consensus guideline committee was formed in 2009 to develop malnutrition using an etiology-based approach. It is no longer appropriate to base malnutrition on labs such as albumin or prealbumin, and clinicians must interpret these labs in the context of inflammation. This slide is an overview of some of the positive versus negative acute phase proteins. Note that negative acute phase proteins are often used as nutrition biomarkers. However, in the inflammatory state, upregulation of the positive acute phase proteins will result in a downregulation of the negative acute phase proteins. For example, in acute illness or injury-related malnutrition, the body will prioritize production 
of antibodies and or coagulation proteins while decreasing production of visceral proteins such as albumin. Because one of albumin's key roles in the body is to maintain oncotic pressure, decreased synthesis of albumin and movement of albumin into the third space will result in fluid accumulation or edema. This concept helps explain why fluid accumulation is part of the characteristics to identify adult malnutrition and is related to the inverse relationship between positive versus negative acute phase responses. Now, practitioners need to understand that the pathophysiology of malnutrition is different depending upon the degree of inflammation. To note, starvation-related malnutrition is void of inflammation and patients typically present with normal albumin status. These patients may fall through the cracks and get misdiagnosed as having normal nutrition status if albumin is used as the main diagnostic indicator of malnutrition. I'm actually a co-author on a paper that describes such an event, and it was published in 2013 in Military Medicine. This slide also highlights that inflammatory states are often mild to moderate in chronic disease-related malnutrition compared to acute illness and injury-related malnutrition, where inflammation is often severe. Metabolic alterations associated with inflammation are predominantly cytokine-mediated and result in loss of lean body mass and diminished function. Practitioners also need to understand the physiological impact of pure starvation versus semi-starvation and recognize the biologic drivers associated with different types of malnutrition. Data from the Minnesota Starvation Study, led by primary investigator Ansel Keys, showed that semi-starvation in subjects receiving a high-carbohydrate, low-protein, hypocaloric diet over six months resulted in approximately 25% weight loss as well as subcutaneous fat and muscle loss. Despite these subjects looking like they suffered from pure starvation, Many of these subjects presented with low albumin levels and subsequent lower extremity edema. Subjects also presented with other clinical signs of malnutrition, including hair loss, anemia, skin changes, and others. This study was instrumental in showing the physiological and psychological impact of semi-starvation. It also showed that macronutrient distribution matters during hypocaloric intake to influence the levels of albumin and fluid accumulation, most likely driven by that inflammatory response. Therefore, dietitians need to understand not only how much their patients are eating, but also the composition of the patient's diet to better understand the etiology of malnutrition and the associated physiological impact. In consideration of etiology-based, context-based malnutrition, the Academy Malnutrition Workgroup and the Aspen Malnutrition Task Force published the outcomes from the Consensus Committee, identifying the six characteristics of adult malnutrition. These include insufficient energy intake, unintentional weight loss, decreased muscle mass, decreased subcutaneous fat, fluid accumulation, and impaired functional status. Note that only two of these characteristics need be present in order to nutritionally diagnose your patient with malnutrition. Furthermore, providers must assess the six characteristics of malnutrition in the context of three clinical situations, including acute illness or injury, chronic illness, and or social and environmental circumstances. The RD is skilled at performing the nutrition care process, including doing a comprehensive nutrition assessment. A full nutrition assessment should be conducted 
on all patients who are identified at nutrition risk, either through a validated nutrition screen or if consulted by a physician. Physical assessment should be a component of that data gathering. And the nutrition assessment should provide the basis for your evidence-based, patient-centered intervention. Let's take a closer look at the six characteristics to identify malnutrition. There are at least two characteristics that do not require the use of physical assessment, and these include inadequate energy intake and unintentional weight loss. Now, I have some references on these slides that I encourage you to refer to, and uh, this is an excellent reference on this slide from the Academy website. These will have the appropriate thresholds that can guide your assessment efforts when deciding on the severity of malnutrition for your patient. This information was used in the development of this presentation. First, we'll talk about inadequate energy intake. It is important to determine whether your patient is at risk for moderate to severe malnutrition by assessing energy intake and comparing it to the calculated or predicted needs. You can see from this slide the percentage of decreased energy intake over time used to identify your patient with non-severe versus severe malnutrition. After you gather your data as part of the nutrition care process, Compare your patient's information to the thresholds provided to help you in identifying the appropriate context as well as the severity of malnutrition. Next, we'll talk about unintentional weight loss. Height, weight, and usual weight need to be obtained in order to determine the percentage of unintentional weight loss so that you can interpret the significance of weight loss over time. Dietitians must also interpret weight status in the context of fluid accumulation or loss, and thus should use the patient's dry weight. When weights or heights are not available in the electronic medical record and patients or caregivers are unable to give subjective measures, dietitians need to take matters into their own hands and use tools such as bed scales to determine weight or knee height or arm span to determine height. After you gather your data as part of the nutrition care process, compare your patient's information to the thresholds provided to help you in identifying the appropriate context as well as the severity of malnutrition. Now we will talk about using nutrition-focused physical assessment to determine the severity of malnutrition. Physical assessment can help you to determine the changes in body composition as well as functional status in your patient. I recommend viewing the two key resources on this slide as well, including information from Subjective Global Assessment as, as well as the Academy regarding physical exam. These two references were instrumental in my presentation today. Now we'll talk about tools in the toolbox. You can see that there are several tools in the toolbox that the dietitians can use to engage in nutrition-focused physical assessment. These tools are divided for you into basic and advanced. Under basic tools, we have rubber gloves so you can follow universal precautions, a tape measure so you can measure lengths, midpoints, and or circumference areas, and the rest of the basic tools come in handy during physical assessment for possible micronutrient deficiencies associated with skin changes, especially within the mouth. These will be further discussed in part three of this three-part series on nutrition-focused physical assessment. Advanced tools used to engage in physical assessment include the hand grip dimometer and calipers to either measure tricep skin fold and or knee height. Other advanced tools include the tuning fork, a reflex hammer, and a stethoscope. Now it is important that we examine, especially with visualization or inspection. That is first and foremost the key. We can also use our sense of touch or palpation within our patients. We want to examine patients on one side of the body as well as both sides of the body. We want to examine 
area of interest for changes in size, color, and shape. We want to look for asymmetry, deformity, and atrophy. We also want to examine the degree and location of swelling or edema. We can also palpate using the three T's, which include texture, temperature, and tenderness. And it is key that we examine each anatomical landmark to determine the degree of muscle and fat loss. I also included a slide on percussion. Percussion is part of the advanced physical assessment exam where you would use a tuning fork and stethoscope along with hearing and touch to assess the tone and examine the organ's border shape and position. Note that the use of percussion is really not necessary to assess for the degree of changes and of the body fat and or muscle. I suggest getting further training on their use and applicability in your facility, as well as the development of departmental policy and procedures before breaking out these tools in the toolbox. The Objective Structure Clinical Examination Resource as well as other key resources provided for you today can help you initiate this process. Dietitians also need to identify anatomical landmarks and properly document their findings using appropriate language. Therefore, a review of anatomical landmarks is needed. As well, this will help you for proper descriptive words for locations which will help you document your findings. So I know that we need to review what we learned in AMP. So before we engage in the nutrition-focused physical assessment with our patient, we need to ask the patient for permission to examine them. You want to explain your goals and what you will be doing. It also helps to approach the nurse for the patient and do the same thing. We want to talk to our multidisciplinary team and explain to them what we will be doing, what our goals are, and to estimate the approximate time it will take. It is also necessary that we always follow universal precautions to prevent disease transmission. First, we will talk about changes in subcutaneous body fat. In all contexts of malnutrition, patients will have mild loss of subcutaneous fat in moderate or non-severe malnutrition. In patients with severe malnutrition, however, subcutaneous fat loss will be moderate among patients with acute illness and injury-related malnutrition and may likely be severe during the context associated with chronic disease and or social or environmental circumstances. These are the key anatomical locations to view for loss of subcutaneous fat. They include the orbital region or the region surrounding the eye. This includes the temporal bone and the cheekbone, which is called the zygomatic arch, the upper arm region, which includes the triceps and biceps, as well as the thoracic and lumbar regions, including the ribs, lower back, and mid-axillary line. And of course, if you are viewing the patient anteriorly, you should also view the pectoralis major and minor. That would be the chest area. Note, fluid retention may mask indication of fat loss. Therefore, you should be aware of the patient's fluid status. Now, as you can see, I will be showing a series of pictures depicting changes in body composition, such as a loss of subcutaneous fat and muscle, as well as fluid accumulation. If we were doing a hands-on training, you would have visual prompts and the opportunity to touch and palpate anatomical landmarks. Since we have limited time today and are not working with live patients, I encourage you to take the time on your own to review these slides carefully and to apply them as you feel appropriate in your clinical practice. The information provided today is meant to increase your knowledge and application of this topic. For many of you, 
this information will be a review. I am simply a voice for dietitians today and hope that this information will inspire you to engage in NFPA. I also encourage you to view the reference provided for you on the Academy website regarding physical exam. This will be a useful resource for you moving forward. Other resources for hands-on trainings are included at the end of this presentation. Now please visualize an actual patient in front of you as we go through and identify the severity of malnutrition, discussing the remainder of the six characteristics of malnutrition. Now you can see on this slide where we're talking about the orbital region. If you walked into the room and you saw a patient with hollow and sunken eye sockets, dark circles, and prominent temporal bone and zygomatic arch, I would hope that you would understand that this patient has indications of severe malnutrition. This would be the same as the patient on the right side of the screen. Notice the differences between these patients. On the left side, the patient may have mild to moderate malnutrition by evidence of the slightly dark circles and somewhat hollow look. Note that malnourished patients will have a loss of fat pad, dark color, and loose skin, whereas well-nourished individuals will have a slightly bulged fat pad. In the upper arm region, we want to focus on the tricep and bicep. It is key to view your patient anteriorly, but you can also look at them from laterals and posterior views. If you're using a tricep skin fold, it is also necessary to have the arm extended, whereas another view would be to have the arm bent at 90 degrees. You want to inspect for fat loss visually and to palpate or pinch the tricep skin fold by avoiding the muscle when inspecting. With well-nourished individuals, you will have ample fat tissue between your skin pinch. In mild to moderate malnutrition, the fingers will almost touch, but you will have an absence of ample fat tissue. In severe malnutrition, patients will present with very little space between the skin. Your fingers will almost touch, and you will have a lot of loose skin, like I have on the individual on the right side of this slide. I also have another depiction of this skin pinch when we get to slide 36. Now this is a posterior view of the thoracic and lumbar region. On slide 36, I have an anterior view. You can look at thoracic and lumbar regions from the anterior view, posterior view, and lateral positions. You want to observe the mid-axillary line ribs and iliac crest, and I have labeled these areas for you. Inspect for loss of fullness as well as loose skin. You can palpate for fat and fullness. In well-nourished individuals, you will have more of a fullness. With mild to moderate malnutrition, the ribs will be apparent and you will have depressions between the ribs being somewhat pronounced with an iliac crest also being somewhat prominent. In severe malnutrition, you will have very apparent depression between the ribs, and you will have a prominent iliac crest like we have in this individual on this illustration. Now we'll talk about changes in muscle mass. You can see that in all contexts of malnutrition, patients will have mild loss of muscle in moderate or non-severe malnutrition. In patients with severe malnutrition, muscle loss will be moderate among patients with acute illness or injury related malnutrition and may likely be severe due to context associated with chronic disease and or social environmental circumstances. Now we'll talk about assessing changes in body composition with the loss of muscle mass and the muscle masses are highlighted here for you. I really encourage you to use a head-to-toe approach. We like to view loss of muscle mass in the following areas, the temple region, clavicular region, scapular region, 
in the hands and in the lower leg region. Note that the lower body is less sensitive to changes in muscle mass, but fluid accumulation from cardiac or pulmonary failure may mask the degree of muscle loss. Furthermore, practitioners should also be mindful of both age-related and obesity-related sarcopenia, making the assessment of muscle loss more tricky. Here is a view of the temporal region focusing on the temporalis. You can see in this slide, we're viewing the temporalis. You want to view your patient anteriorly, and you can also view them laterally. You need to inspect for the degree of scooping or hollowing and prominence of that temporal bone. In well-nourished individuals, the muscle will be evident with no hollowing. With mild to moderate malnutrition, you will have a slight hollowing compared to an individual with severe malnutrition where well, you will have a loss of the fat pad, severe hollowing, scooping, and depression. You will also show a prominent fat brow, and therefore you will be able to distinguish between severe malnutrition and mild to moderate malnutrition. Now let's say you walk into the room and you have a patient that has a very well-rounded shoulder area or deltoid muscle. This patient most likely has normal nutrition status. I have highlighted some anatomical landmarks for you, including the coracoid process and the acromion process. When individuals have malnutrition, these areas will protrude depending on the severity of malnutrition. You want to inspect laterally, anteriorly, and posteriorly. You want to inspect the acromioclavicular joint, clavicle, and deltoid. As I said before, you want to inspect for this loss of roundness at the junction of the shoulder and neck and assess for the degree of squaring. In these pictures, you can see that on the left side, you have a severely wasted individual with very square deltoid and prominent acromion process. In the middle, you have slight squaring. And as I said before, you have a normal, well-rounded deltoid area on the patient on your right. Now, the clavicular muscle wasting is probably one of your most common areas to look at. We have the sternoclavicular joint that I have highlighted here for you, as well as that acromion process. Again, you want to look at your patient anteriorly and inspect and palpate for the prominence of the clavicle, acromion process, as well as your coracoid process. You want to examine for the hollowing between the neck and the clavicle, which is called the sternocleidomastoid area and examine the pectoral and deltoid muscle for bony prominence. The picture on the left side shows that bony prominence, especially in that sternoclavicular joint area, and you can see a prominent acromion process. The picture on the left shows deep clevity in the sternocleidomastoid and prominent clavicular bone. The next slide is talking about scapular muscle wasting. Now the scapula is labeled for you on this picture, and you can see how it protrudes. You want to inspect from the posterior and lateral views. It helps to have the patient lift their arms anteriorly and push against a hard object. You want to inspect medial, lateral, superior, and inferior borders of the spine, as well as the following muscles the trapezius, the deltoids, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and the latissimus dorsi. With severe malnutrition, you will have, again, the squaring and the prominence of these bony landmarks. Next, we'll talk about the hand. We can have our patients actually place their hand on a flat surface with their palm facing down. 
you can inspect the interosseous muscle between the thumb and the forefinger. Have the patient squeeze the thumb to the forefinger, as I have shown here on the right side, to view the bulge or the muscle when flexed. Palpate the muscle using your thumb and index finger. Now the area should be bulged or slightly bulged in well-nourished males and slightly bulged or flat in females. The degree of depression and loss of muscle depends on the severity of muscle loss. Let's look at the lower extremity. Here this individual is sitting and showing a prominent patellar region. With individuals, you can have them sit or stand, and you want to compare one side to another to determine unilateral versus bilateral muscle loss. Note that unilateral muscle loss usually denotes a neurological disorder or injury. The visualization of bony landmarks depends on the severity of muscle loss. This individual clearly has prominent patellar region, wasting of the gastronemius or the calf muscle, as well as wasting of the quadricep muscle. This is what you would see in a typical severely malnourished individual. With mild to moderate malnutrition, you would have a somewhat rounded patellar region, and less developed muscle than a well-nourished, but we really want our patients to have well-developed muscles. Now this slide is an illustration of what you would see if you went into the room and you had a severely malnourished individual. Note that there's absence of edema due to these illustrations of protein energy malnourished individuals. And note that protein energy malnutrition was historically referred to as marasmus. In figure A, again, you have that very little space between the fingers as you are demonstrating the skin pinch. Figure B shows prominent temporal bone and zygomatic arch. You can clearly see loss of fat and muscle. Figure C shows a loss of scapular bone region, including all of the muscles that we discussed, such as the trapezius, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and latissimus dorsi. Figure D illustrates prominent iliac crest and the thoracic region. And finally, figure E shows prominent tibialis bone, loss of muscle and fat in the lower leg. We are going to talk about assessing changes in fluid. Fluid accumulation can be viewed in several areas. It is recommended that the extremities are viewed for a mobile patient. For a bedridden or activity restricted patient, you can actually view the vulva area or the scrotal area for edema. Note that peritoneal edema or ascites is often associated with end-stage liver disease or protein malnutrition, which is also referred to as quashure core, especially in pediatric populations. Patients may also present with generalized edema or anasarca. In addition, lower extremity edema may be due to congestive heart failure and or pulmonary insufficiency. It is important that we use the sense of visualization and touch when we are assessing for edema. Again, it is important that we assess for unilateral versus bilateral swelling. We want to inspect for the swelling in the contours of the leg, the ankle, and the feet. We want to inspect and palpate for the loss of contours of the malleoli, the extensor tendons of the foot, which will no longer be visualized. And palpate by gently squeezing the top of the foot, ankle, or front of the lower leg, or by gently pressing the skin. Note the degree of impression and time to correct. I added for you today the edema scale. You can actually look at the electronic medical record for the nursing assessment. So if all of you are on EPIC, 
you can actually find this under the DocFlow cardiovascular tab to find the edema rating. You can also look under simple and or complex assessment. Now, this shows you the 1 plus through the 4 plus edema scale, and it also highlights for you how long the depression will last. These show the thresholds for moderate versus severe malnutrition. In all contexts of malnutrition, patients will have mild fluid accumulation in moderate or non-severe malnutrition. In patients with severe malnutrition, fluid accumulation will be moderate to severe among patients with acute illness and injury-related malnutrition and may likely be severe due to context associated with chronic disease and or social environmental circumstances. Please remember that the degree of fluid accumulation will be related to the inflammatory milieu and the loss of oncotic pressure associated with hypoalbuminemia. Finally, we're going to talk about assessing changes in functional status. This slide shows various ways to assess your patient's functional status. Notice that many of them do not apply to the hospitalized patient or to the hospitalized patient who is critically ill. Many of these functional status measures will work nicely in a long-term care facility or rehab facility. The strongest correlation to date with muscle mass and nutritional status is the hand dynamometer. I use the Jamal digital dynamometer to assess functional status among my patients. However, it works best when you have a frequent flyer or a long length of stay where you can use the data points to assess over time. In the inpatient setting, I also use other measures of functional status, such as inability to sit, stand, walk, perform activities of daily living, or out-of-bed transfers. Some sophisticated measures of functional status and those that are getting a little bit of press these days are lung function tests. You can see on this slide, it shows the thresholds for people who are satisfying the diagnosis of moderate or non-severe malnutrition compared to severe malnutrition. Now I would like to switch gears a little bit. And once you complete your nutrition assessment, it is your responsibility to document your findings. We discussed in webinar one how you would structure your nutrition diagnosis statement once you've identified that your patient has malnutrition. Remember that it is necessary for you to identify the severity of malnutrition and that dietitians cannot code for malnutrition. And thus, we rely on physicians and other licensed independent practitioners to code for patients with severe compared to non-severe malnutrition. Also reviewed from webinar one, major complication and comorbidity codes have greater severity of illness and require the most hospital resources to treat and thus are reimbursed at the highest level. Complication and comorbidity codes are associated with the second highest level of severity and resource consumption. This slide is a review of the malnutrition codes that are considered MCCs, or major complication comorbidities, compared to CCs, complication and comorbidities. It also shows a few codes that are considered non-CCs. It is your responsibility to know these codes and the associated impact on levels of reimbursement. It is also your responsibility to pick your battles when collaborating with multidisciplinary team members. For example, if the physician codes the patient with failure to thrive, which is a non-CC, but based on your nutrition assessment, you have nutritionally diagnosed the patient with moderate malnutrition, this would be a discrepancy that I would try to resolve. I would contact the physician personally and discuss with him or her my concerns about the patient and describe the evidence that I see which would justify a complication comorbidity malnutrition code for the patient. 
However, if my physician coded my patient with cachexia, which is a complication comorbidity code, I probably would not fight that battle. I would not try to change the code to moderate malnutrition unless I worked more closely with my coding department to understand the subtle differences in reimbursement. The battles that we need to fight, in particular, are those where patients are not coded with any malnutrition at all, or those whose malnutrition codes are not identifying them with the appropriate level of severity. Now, I have provided a little mini case study. And uh, so in this individual, you have an 85-year-old female patient. She was admitted with pneumonia. She has a BMI of 18.6. She weighs 47.73 kilograms. She's 160 centimeters. Her usual body weight, based on previous visits to the primary care physician three months ago, and also per weight graph and per report, was 115 pounds. This just happened to be her calculated ideal body weight based on Hamley. And we received a consult from the doctor for low PO intake for this patient. Luckily, this patient had a surrogate with her. Her daughter was there and stated a decreased appetite over six months. So we have historic data. And we know that she has less than or equal to 50% estimated intake over one week prior to admission with an estimated 2 to 3% weight loss. As we perform our comprehensive nutrition assessment, we also include our nutrition-focused physical assessment, and we found fat and muscle loss. Now, I have highlighted the anatomical areas for you that I felt were, um, were highlighted here. So I looked at triceps fat. I found moderate to severe muscle loss in the temporalis region in the clavicular region, the scapular region, as well as the interosseous and the dorsal hand. I also saw lower extremity uh, loss of muscle and fat, and this patient was void of edema. The history and physical discusses that the patient had a, a dementia and difficulty performing activities of daily living, which indicated impaired functional status. Now, at discharge, this patient will be placed at a skilled nursing facility. So my nutrition diagnosis statement could look something like this. Severe malnutrition related to, and I actually believe that this patient qualifies for several contexts of malnutrition, including acute illness, her pneumonia, chronic illness, her dementia, and social environmental circumstances because she had inability for self-care. So I actually had all context in this nutrition diagnosis statement. My signs and symptoms statement included my 9% unintentional weight loss over the three months, which qualified for severe malnutrition, and less than or equal to 50% estimated intake over one week, and I also can have that severe subcutaneous fat and muscle loss, and you can mention the specific anatomy if you desire. Now remember that according to the characteristics defining adult malnutrition, only two characteristics are needed, and you may not want to include all possible contexts. So you could modify this statement to be more succinct. You may say severe malnutrition related to acute illness as evidenced by and have your indicators of decreased energy intake as well as your amount, percentage, time variable for your unintentional weight loss. Now on my third bullet, I would like to have a caveat on this. I have here an example for you that I actually brought in a code and notice that I brought in a BMI of less than 19. But this may muddy your water a little bit. Now I have 
determined that this patient has severe malnutrition. And by me putting in a sign and symptom of a BMI less than 19, I might be doing myself a disservice. Why? Because that physician may then actually code for that BMI of less than 19, which is actually considered a complication comorbidity code. And I'm really trying to get this patient a major complication comorbidity code with severe protein calorie malnutrition. So in other words, you may not want to include a BMI indicator if you are writing a nutritional diagnosis for severe malnutrition. If you are writing a nutrition diagnosis focusing on mild or moderate malnutrition, then I believe that adding a BMI less than 19 can help your case. I hope that this mini case study have given you some opportunities to understand how you would wordsmith or document in your medical record the degree of malnutrition. Now finally, we have a call to action. Nutrition-focused physical assessment is key to identifying non-severe versus severe malnutrition. You want to initiate a plan of action at your facility to incorporate nutrition-focused physical assess assessment effectively. You want to collaborate with team members and team leaders, such as clinical nutrition managers and other nutrition ambassadors, who will advocate for the RD to be the expert in malnutrition identification, treatment, and prevention to improve patient outcomes. I have to acknowledge the clinical nutrition manager who I collaborate with and commend that person for being an advocate for us. And her knowledge base is top of the line in order to help our cause. I have provided for you a checklist for dietitians. And I hope that this checklist can help you obtain your goals and to elevate the role of the RD in engaging in nutrition-focused physical assessment. I have also provided two key resources for hands-on training, one at the Cleveland Clinic and the other one at Rutgers University School of Health-Related Professions. I want to thank you so much for your time today, and I hope that you will stay tuned for our third webinar, Nutrition Focused Physical Assessment, and this is my very favorite for micronutrient deficiencies, where we will continue to discuss the role of the dietitian in elevating the role of nutrition assessment by engaging an NFPA to nutritionally diagnose micronutrient deficiencies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Frank. That was excellent. It was very, very informative webinar on a very important topic. Thank you again. Um, again, anybody who has questions, you feel free to type them into the questions pane on your control panel. And I have a few questions already. And the first one is, um, can you explain how you best work with the RNs if they are resistant to having the RDs examine or touch the patients? Well, sometimes it's uh, more difficult than it sounds. I mean, sometimes uh, nurses are very territorial, and if they're not used to the dietitian touching the patient, they will get off their chair or come into the room and ask what we're doing. And so it's really, again, about that education and collaborative support. And that's why we had the first webinar encouraging the clinical nutrition manager and the team to set the stage for success prior to going into the room and touching the patient without explaining this to the, uh, the multidisciplinary team. Uh, so I feel like setting the stage is very important and then if there are people who come in after the stage has been set, uh, you will have the power to be able to do nutrition-focused physical assessment uh, by 
explaining to them your goals and how it will only improve the patient outcomes. Okay, thank you. We've got a few questions here about resources. Um, the first one is, um, what ratio do you recommend for um, RDs patients if you are going to do a full nutrition focused physical assessment on those that are suspected of malnutrition? What, and, uh, also, well, and the other part of that question is, do you, um, uh, is doing nutrition focused physical assessment a justification for getting more dietitians in your facility? Okay, now I am not a clinical nutrition manager, and so that actually is a, a better question for that CNM because I don't have that financial stress uh, behind me. You know, I, I work with uh, closely with my CNM here, and, and you're right. Uh, there are a lot of time constraints to do a full nutrition-focused physical assessment, and that is why visual inspection is really key it's great to be able to do a full NFPA and to touch and palpate, but if that's not practical for you and you do have time constraints and you have FTE constraints, then at least you should be doing uh, a visual inspection of those uh, bony landmarks to be able to determine the severity of malnutrition. Okay, thank you. Um, how long do you, do you, does it typically take to do the assessment? A full I mean, assessment. During the full assessment, it would take about 20 minutes. Yeah. So how much time will that take you if you have 20 patients to see? Um, you know, you are going to have to prioritize. And remember that there are six characteristics of malnutrition and that there are a lot of ways that you can skin the cat. So. What you really want to prioritize is perhaps in your full assessment, your initial assessment, uh, you will pick and choose what patients you'll be able to do a full nutrition assessment on, and others you may just do a visual inspection. It, it is really up to uh, the amount of patients you have and the time that you have. I feel that the more that we do this, and the more that we find our quality metrics being improved, that hopefully we will be able to justify more dietitians on the scene and uh, we'll be able to justify doing more hands-on approach with our patients. How does um, the effect of neuropathy, how does that affect the hand exam? Well, neuropathy will impair muscle development, and so that is something that you will gather with your history and physical. We'll talk a little bit more about neuropathy when we get to webinar three, because as you know, some micronutrient deficiencies will drive neuropathy. Also, uh, we have differences in unilateral and bilateral muscle wasting uh, due to the decrease in neuromuscular stimulation through neuropathy. So it, it does influence it, and that is something that you will need to note. How about patients with arthritis? What about doing the uh, grip strength test on a lot of patients that have arthritis? I don't do that with people who have severe arthritis. If, if they're impaired and they cannot comfortably use the, the hand grip strength, I do not do that with those, those patients. Uh, I have students do a case study. And so each of my students are required to do the hand grip dynamometer in their case study, but if we have the patient who is unable to do the hand grip dynamometer, then we don't force the patient to do that, and, and they just don't, don't do that piece. Does dementia fall into the category of chronic illness, and does it have an inflammatory component? That's a very good question. The answer is yes, there is an inflammatory component. In fact, I, uh, in my postdoc, I was actually a postdoc in Alzheimer's disease, uh, switching out of uh, inflammatory-related cancer. So, you know, unfortunately, inflammation is the root of all evil, as we say. Uh, now, you asked if it had a, um, a chronic versus acute illness or injury-related context, and I would say that dementia has a chronic context. 
However, you can have acute exacerbations in this area. So again, that is something that you will determine through your H&P. Another question about in, um, inflammatory conditions, are there specific levels of CRP that would help place a patient in moderate versus severe inflammatory category? That is a very good question, and we really don't have that data. You know, if you uh, do some data gathering with your patients, you will see that most of the CRP data is related to congestive heart failure. And very low levels are shown, and I think, um, I, I can't remember the unit of measure now, um, but most patients are going to be coming in anywhere from, you know, 30 to 100, up to 200. And so I have always searched and searched for uh, a threshold that will then say, give us a hint as to how it relates. So I encourage any researchers out there who are doing this, uh, perhaps Dr. Jensen has this data to look at. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you. I don't, I don't really have a magic bullet for your answer today, um, but I think that's something that we need to, to be monitoring. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, very much. Actually, it is, um, we're out of time. Um, and thank you again for the wonderful lecture and um, participating in the question and answer session. I'd like to thank you again for your presentation and thank each of you, or you for your participation. On behalf of the Nestle Nutrition Institute, we hope that you find this information valuable to your practice and enjoy the rest of your day.